Please be seated. appreciate the invitation that Bill gives me so frequently when I come up here to speak, and uh, we'll certainly be praying for you in the next few days and few weeks. May God bless you in this surgery. It sounds like it's been long overdue. But being with all of you, some of you that I've known for so long and so well, and being in this winter wonderland, which people in Tampa can't possibly relate to. It reminds me of the little boy where you know, there was a, a father who wanted to teach his little boy about all the lessons of God's love and goodness and his richness toward us. So he took the little boy to the top of a hill and he pointed, pointed northward over the ocean and westward, westward over the hills and the valleys. And then sweeping his arm around just in a whole circling motion, looking at the entire horizon, he said, Now, little Johnny, my son, God's love is just like all of that, as big as all of that. And the little boy, with his big sparkling eyes, looked up at his daddy and he says, Well, Dad, we must be right smack dab in the middle of all of it. <laughs> and I sometimes feel that way when I'm with you, and I hope you feel the same way as God's people gather together to worship study and to grow. Think with me, turn your New Testament over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Think with me just for a few minutes as we begin. I want to think with you a little bit with respect to love, but specifically in a, for a few minutes, I want to talk with you a little bit about this church with respect to how this church grew. And it grew so radically, so drastically in what appears to be a very short period of time. We know that in Acts chapter 2, after the great preaching of Peter, so much uh, to the point that they responded to the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to Peter's boldness, they responded with the greatest question we'll ever hear anybody ask. You know, what do we need to do? What shall we do? And we know that in response to that, being pricked in their heart, and asking that question, we know that about 3,000 souls were saved. That's a lot of growth in a short period of time. Maybe in just a couple of days it took to baptize all those people into Jesus Christ. But we know that it didn't stop there. Turn over to Acts chapter 4 and notice verse 4 with me. Acts chapter 4 verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Again, what we're seeing is incredible growth. Now drop down to chapter 6 and verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was, who knows the next word, multiplying greatly. Drop down to verse 7. And the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests even were obedient to the faith. Now, it's difficult to know for sure at this time just how big this church is. I'm not going to over, oversell the idea of big numbers or anything like that, but a lot of experts feel like the church in Jerusalem might have been 20 or 25 or 30,000. It's difficult to know for sure, but this was an enormous group of God's people, and they still continue to grow. And I think it's always worth our time to just stop and think about why. Why did this church grow so radically in what appears to be a short period of time? Are there some lessons that we can learn? Are there some lessons that we can learn at the North Boulevard Church in Tampa and the church here in Hammond? Are there some lessons that we can learn individually about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people? And then invigorating the lives of our brothers and sisters as well. This church grew for several reasons. Now drop back to chapter 2 and notice with me verse 42. Let's read that together. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. What do you think there's anything in that verse that might indicate to us a mindset about these brethren? How about the word steadfast? 
The word steadfast means endurance or persevering. And one of the biggest reasons why churches in our country are not growing today as they could and should is this on again, off again status of so many of our church members. Doesn't God deserve better than that? But doesn't he deserve everything that we can give once we've made the decision to name the name of Jesus Christ? We come out of the waters of baptism. Don't we owe it to him? I mean, we love him because he first what? Loved us. I mean, are we supposed to give him everything that we can? But instead, we see people on again, off again. We see them for a while, then we won't see them, and we don't hear them for weeks or months at a time. And I'll tell you what, we ought to throw up the red flag and act concerned because someone might that, like that just might be losing their soul. But the church of our Lord needs people who are not quitters. That we will not throw in the spiritual towel when things get difficult or whatever the case. We serve an awesome, almighty God. Sometimes we see people who are jealous for a little while and then all of a sudden, where did they go? What happened? Where was their commitment? Was it not real? We're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every Monday night at our home, if you're in the area, come on by. We have a Bible study, and that's the theme of that study. I need it, and you do too, and everybody that comes to studies like that needs to know that they need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, remain ye, what? Steadfast. Steadfast, always abound into the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Without a doubt, this church growth here is in part because they were steadfast. I will pray for you. I hope you'll pray for me that I always remain steadfast and immovable. But secondly, in the same verse, we see that the apostles' doctrine there. I mean, now maybe you already know this, but maybe this would be a, a good way to maybe highlight that particular verse in your Bible. The church didn't just follow anybody or anything. They, apost they, they followed the apostles' doctrine. There was something in that that needs to be noted, that they didn't listen to the local preacher or the local guy on TV. They didn't have TV back then. They didn't follow anyone or anything. They, they followed that wisdom that came down from up above because that's the wisdom that cannot be wrong. We know that another word for doctrine is teaching. They didn't do any of the teaching on their own. They taught word for word inspiration of the Holy Spirit if they didn't get it from the Lord himself. You know what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 3, verse 3 to 6. He says, how that by revelation, that which is being revealed, not something that can't be understood, that which is being revealed, Paul says, how that by revelation God made known to me the mystery. As I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you might understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not being known to, son, to the sons of men, but is now being revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. That's what your local evangelist needs to preach, and I know that he does. And that's what any preacher worth his salt needs to preach today. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's what preachers need to preach today. And we need to get back to preaching book, chapter, and verse. And I've got news for you. If you don't know this, there's a departure away from New Testament Bible-based preaching and teaching today. And we need to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered and never shirk in our responsibilities or be ashamed of the soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. If anyone is ever going to be converted to Jesus Christ today, it is going to be through an adherence of the Word of God that might, might read it and study it and then apply it to their lives. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. But we don't have a lot of that preaching and teaching today. Reminds me of the young preacher that just graduated from uh, a preaching school, we'll just say in Tennessee somewhere. And he began his first local work, let's just say in Kentucky somewhere. <laughs> and he's one to demonstrate his zeal, you know, and his knowledge that everything that he had gotten in the last few years. And so right off the start, you know, he wants to preach a hard-hitting sermon on the sin of gambling. And this is in Kentucky. And so Monday morning, some of the leading members came and told, you know, the minister, you know, hey, about one-third of the congregation... They, they race uh, racehorses, you know, you're not off to a very good start. 
The second Sunday came and he switched topics. You know, he delivered a powerful sermon on the sin of whiskey and drunkenness. And the next morning, several of the older folks went to his office and advised him about a third of the congregation raised of barley corn. You better be careful. Then the third Sunday, the minister preached on the sin of tobacco, and the elders told him about one third of the congregation raised tobacco for a living. Your job is on the line. And so the fourth Sunday, the preacher delivered a hard-hitting, powerful message. He pulled out all the stops. The subject was the sin of fishing in the territorial waters off Nova Scotia between May and July. <laughs> the poor preacher didn't know what to preach on, so you've got to tell... <laughs> You've got to tell that young preacher to preach the word. That's what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Be in season and out of season. You know, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Well, we'll move over to chapter 4, verse uh, 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Let's just see if we have anything in that verse that might have contributed to the growth, the staggering growth of this New Testament church. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Do you see anything in that verse that might indicate why this church would have grown? How about the idea of unity? The idea of unity. Here we have lots of people in the tens of thousands for sure. And the text says, and I quote, that they were of one heart and one soul. I'll tell you what, I don't know if there's a greater compliment that could be paid a congregation of God's people than it could be said about them that they are of one heart and one soul, as Paul told the Corinthians, of the same mind and the same judgment. What an amazing thing to be able to say about this congregation. That they fight for one another, not against one another. That they support and they lift and they build up one another. They don't tear one another down. What an amazing thing. It's a, a remarkable statement. It's right there in the Bible. I know that it is an accurate representation of what this congregation was. And instead of in a lot of places, especially this past year, we see division, we see fragmentation. And I can't help but think that God is displeased with all of that. What God wants us to do when there are times of adversity or confusion or un, you know, we're uncertain about this or that is he wants us to rally together. He wants us to be together. He wants us to be of one heart and one soul. Now let me ask you a question. I don't really have any idea. Have you contributed? Or maybe somebody's listening in on this call. I don't know. We have a conference call. They can't come. They listen in on the call. Have you contributed more to the unity of this congregation or to the fragmentation of this congregation? It's one or the other. Ask yourself. And maybe ask a few people that you're close to about that, about you. They might give you an answer you weren't, uh, you wasn't expecting. Ask, a, ask the question. We're going to have to be committed to being of one heart and one soul. Put away jealousy and gossip and anger and pride and all of these kinds of things. I'll tell you something that Jesus wanted so much that he dedicated a whole chapter of it in John chapter 17. He prayed for unity, not just for these disciples, but for all that would one day call on my name. Let us be unified in what we do. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 also is the idea of concern. Chapter 34 verse 35 nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for they all were possessors of lands and houses. They all sold them and brought the proceeds and the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, distributed as each had need. This wasn't a communistic doling out of, you know, a total socialistic approach. Everybody got the, a, a ration of stuff. That wasn't what it was. The idea, though, is in the New Testament times, there was a great disparity between those who had and those who didn't have. It wasn't like today where you have all the different socioeconomic classes. Either you had or you didn't have. The idea here was that if you had a lot and another brother or sister over here was really struggling, that you helped them out. Now, the question that I've asked a couple of places, certainly in Tampa, the question that I would ask is not could you sell your home for your brethren, but would you? Would you sell your home? And lay the 
proceeds at Dale and Tom's feet and say, listen, they need it more than I do. I know it's right there in the word of God. I know that they've done it. And this wasn't the first time that they've done it. What an amazing demonstration of love and concern. You know, there's just a lot of little things that a congregation can do to show love to one another. You can, you can still start by just saying it. But, you know, saying it doesn't matter much. Saying I love you really doesn't mean that I love you. Saying I love you is fine. What's better is what can I do for you? How can I serve you? I'm concerned for you. How can I help? Those are all far better manifestations of the love that we say is in our hearts from time to time. What about just sending a card? When's the last time we've done that? But we'd rather send a text or an email, right? I guarantee you getting a letter means a lot more. Put a stamp on it. Oh, I know it costs, what does it cost these days? 50 cents or whatever, I get a roll. I don't even know how much they are. Send a letter. <laughs> I guarantee you it's always, always going to mean more than a text or a quick email. And they'll read it. If you're old school like me, you still write cursive writing. <laughs> Some of the kids are like, what is that? And I don't know about you, but when I receive a card, it always, it just always seems to be at exactly the right time that I'm greatly encouraged. But it's no wonder that so many churches are not growing like they could and should. I've been in places, I've been in meetings where sometimes somebody comes forward and they're baptized, and afterwards we're singing a song and we're waiting for the person to come out of the baptistry so we can hug them and love them and encourage them, and they've opened up the doors and half the congregation is gone. What is wrong with us sometimes? Here we have a new brother or sister in Christ, or maybe somebody comes back and is restored or wants to repent and confess sin or whatever. Why is anybody leaving? We have a brother or sister in Christ who needs their family. So many little things you can do to express love and concern. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. Let most of what you do be done with love. Is that what it says? The Apostle Paul, an inspired man, says, let all that you do be done with love. Now, maybe I've said this to this congregation before, but there's no superlatives to all. There's no like all or, or more all or most all. All is all. The Apostle Paul said, let all that you do be done with love. It's very near the end of, of this particular chapter. He makes that announcement to the Corinthian brethren. This is a very mixed group of people, obviously. Had all kinds of problems. And a very corrupt, uh, sinister city. And the lifestyle there was so decadent. And is it any wonder that to a people of divisiveness and unfaithfulness and incest and legal problems and sexual immorality and pride and arrogance and legal disputes that he ends this book by saying, let all that you do be done with love. This great kind of love, sacrificial love. I don't have to tell this audience that there are different words, Greek words for love in the New Testament. There are a lot of words that are easily defined in Scripture, and except for the definition that says God is love, this necessarily isn't one of those easily defined words. But I'll tell you one thing, it's not in the abstract. Love is not in the sentiments that we have. It's not in the emotional department in our minds, that I love this person, that's the way that I feel. That's not what the New Testament meaning of love is at all. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 13. Many of you probably have these verses hanging in your home somewhere, maybe in multiple places. But in verses 4 through 7, we have 15 different properties attributed to love. And although in the English it doesn't read this way, in the Greek, all 15 of these words are in the verb form. In other words, this is not what love says. This is not what love feels. This is what love does. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying there. If you love somebody, this is the way you will act. If you love somebody, this is the way you will treat them. This is the way you will serve them and sacrifice for them. This is saying that if love were a person, this is 
what love would do. This is how love behaves. And, and the context of this course, uh, of this, of course, is in the midst of spiritual gifts. I'm not sure how they messed up all the spiritual gifts that are listed and in, in enumerated in chapter 12 and chapter 14. Have you ever wondered why the placement of chapter 13 is so bizarre in some ways? Right smack dab in the middle of that, he says, hold on a second. You can be able to do all of these things, but if you don't have the most important thing, the greatest thing, if you don't have love, forget all of it. <laughs> i tell you what, that is a lesson I surely must understand. There are some things I can maybe misunderstand about the Word of God. This isn't one of them. I have to entirely and completely sacrifice for my family, for my wife, my kids. Ask me about my grandkids later. We'll talk about them for hours. But it's so fitting for us to always think about the most important thing. How important is it? It's only the most important thing. The Apostle Paul says, now by faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You probably have committed these verses to memory, right? Love suffers long. Love is kind always. You don't have the right to be unkind. And shockingly, where, where we are the most unkind is uh, with our brethren or at home with our families, with the people that we love the most. We are so unkind to them. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love is not rude. Love does not act rudely. You don't have the right to slice and dice your brethren because you feel your personal judgment about something is better than somebody else's. You forfeit that right when you name the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is always our example, our example for all of us, men and women, and Jesus was never rude to somebody. It does not seek its own. It does not seek your own way. Love does not seek your own will. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It thinks the best about your brother or sister in Christ. It does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. How important is this? It's only the most important thing. Peter says, above all things have, who remembers? Above all things have fervent love. But does that describe the love you have for your brethren? Just think about that. Think about that. Well, the, could the rest of the brethren say, man, they have fervent love for me. Sometimes we're so rude, and love is just completely lacking in our church family and in our families at home. I think it's pretty obvious when we look around that families across the country are falling apart. Everywhere we turn, Debbie and I have seen it everywhere. I mean, no society, no part of the country is impervious to this kind of pain and and I certainly don't stand before you as somebody claiming to have all of the answers, but I do know one thing, that everything would be better if love was at the motive for what is said or done. And again, this passage is not telling us what we've just looked at. This is not telling us how to feel. Love is not about what you feel. Love is about how you act. Love is about how you treat somebody. And it's telling us that if we're going to fix those things that are broken in our marriages or in our homes, we're going to have to start acting like love acts. It's been said that it's easier to act yourself into feeling better than to feel yourself into acting better. I wish I were smart enough to have come up with that. <laughs> but I'm not. But I sure do subscribe to the principle of it. It's easier to act yourself into feeling better than it is to feel yourself into acting better. And I believe this is a scriptural concept. You want to make your marriage better? Anybody here? Then start acting like this, whether you like it or not. Start acting like this, whether you feel like it or not. And then one thing will happen is that you'll start feeling like it later. Because the power found in this kind of sacrificial love. You know, the Bible nowhere 
commands wives to love the husbands the way husbands are supposed to love their wives in that higher form. We know that in the New Testament, there's several words, but mostly there's there's the, the highest form of word of agape and then phileo, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. But those are really the two words that are used. The higher form means I'm going to love you no matter what, even if you don't love me, no matter how you treat me, no matter how you respond to me, what you say about me or what you do, I'm still going to love you no matter what. That's the kind of love that Christ had for us. Well, when Paul says the husbands love your wives, that's always the higher form, the highest form of the word love. Nowhere except for in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, that it says that wives are supposed to love their husbands. And when they do, that's actually the lower form. Well, does that mean that wives are not supposed to love their husbands at all? No, that doesn't mean what it says. That's not what it says at all. But what it means is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Our love towards Christ is in response to the great love that he showed us. And so as husbands, one thing, one thing that I have to know is that it is responsible, I am responsible for initiating and beginning that kind of love. Husbands are told to love their wives. Wives are told to submit to their husbands. Well, here's what God wants to happen. The husbands are responsible for initiating that kind of love. That's what Paul commanded. And what's that going to make the wife going to want to do? What's that going to make her want to do? Well, that's going to make her want to love him back even more and submit to him as the head of the family more than she did before. And what's that going to make the husband want to do? Well, that's going to make him try even harder and love her even more and even more sacrificially. And so we see this good cycling in a good way, an upward cycle, if you will. Here's what often happens. A husband doesn't, life, doesn't love his wife. She knows it. Sometimes other people know it. The wife responds by saying, okay, Mr. Two can play that game. I'm going to love you even less than I did before. If you can treat me like that, I'm going to love you even less. I'm going to forget about this subjection thing, this submissive thing. I'm not going to submit to you, and I'm not going to love you either. The husband says, okay, fine. I can play that way too. I'm going to love you even less than I did before. And so we have this attacking and this counter-attacking, this downward spiral away from God's plan. It's amazing how husbands and wives can treat each other from time to time. Maybe you heard about the couple who drove several miles down a country road, out in the middle of nowhere, not saying a word to one another. They'd gotten bad, involved in a bad fight. They were still fighting from an earlier discussion, and no one wanted to concede their position, you know. So as they passed by a barnyard of mules and pigs, the wife sarcastically said, relatives of yours? <laughs> and without missing a beat, the husband said, yep, they're my in-laws. <laughs> It's, it's, am it's amazing how we can treat one another. <laughs> Maybe you've heard about the, you know, the man and the wife who traveled to Jerusalem. And she was kind of a nagging wife, from according to the story. And while they were there, the wife passed away. And the undertaker told the husband, you know, look, you can have her body shipped back home for $5,000. Or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for only 150. The man thought about it for about 10 seconds and he said, no, I'm just going to have her shipped back home. And the undertaker looked at him kind of puzzled and said, well, why would you do that? Why, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your wife back home and you could spend $150 to have her buried right here in the Bible lands? He said, well, long ago, there was a man that died here, was buried here, and three days later he rose from the dead. And I just can't take that chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I know nobody here would ever say or do anything like that regarding their spouse, <laughs> so, or at least live to tell about it. But when you read verses like what we just read about, love does not behave rudely. I've wondered about that. And where are we the most rude? With our church family and then with our, with our brothers and sisters? In our homes. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13 thinks no evil. That's really not a good translation. The Greek word there is logizomai, logizomai. And what that means is love does not keep track of your sins or your wrongs. It is a, an, an accountant's term. God does not keep books, He does not keep a running tally of who's more right or who's more wrong. And that's not what we do in marriages. 
saying love doesn't keep track of the sins. One fellow said, my wife sometimes gets hysterical, but most of the time she gets historical. <laughs> and men can do just the same thing. We bring things up. And we get in trouble. But we're going to have to figure out a way to really, really love one another. It is the greatest thing. I'm fortunate to be delivering first sermon of the year, I suppose, here. And I didn't know what to preach on. I've preached lots of things here, but I'll tell you one thing I know. This has been a tough year. And the saddest thing of all is we've seen the withering faith of so many people. In so many congregations, people's faith are just withering and drifting into non-existence. How could we possibly give up our faith? Would we consider everything that this man did for me and did for you. He willingly laid down his life for us. You look at the scene, you read that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'll tell you, you read that scene, you should read it over and over and be familiar with every detail of that night in that garden. One of the things that we'll see when we read that is that when we pray to God, it's not always about what I can get out of it, because Jesus didn't get out of that prayer what he wanted. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Is there any other way to save mankind from their sins? Is there some other way? God answered the prayer and said, no, this is the way. We're going to save their sins. You're going to have to die. And certainly with respect to love, love is never about how I can get my way. Love is about how I can serve. Can you think of a greater legacy that anybody might ever be able to attribute to you when you're long gone? That maybe on a tombstone they might be able to say, this was a man or this was a woman of service. Is there a greater legacy of service than something like that? Is there a greater thing that we could ever possibly do than be remembered for the way that we loved and the way that we served? A man said to a high school student, well, your, your high school course is finished now. You've done well. He said, yeah, I graduate today. Did pretty well. Honors, you know. Got some scholarships lined up. The older man said, that's awesome. Well, then what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to go through college. I'm going to take up a profession, negotiate a good job. And the old man said, that's great. You know, then what are you going to do? He said, well, I'll probably marry a fine woman, probably make a fortune, and I'll be a success in the world. The old man says, I believe you can. What are you going to do then? He said, well, I'm going to retire, I suppose, you know, and travel and enjoy the world and enjoy my wealth and kind of take it easy. And the old man said, that's great. Then what are you going to do? He said, well, I guess old age will set in and I hope to enjoy that too. The old man said, well, and then what? He said, well, I, I guess then I'm, I'm going to die, I suppose. You know what the old man then said. And then what? Because brethren, are we all living now and working now for the then what? Are we living now serving and loving and sacrificing for one another and for him for the then what? Because that's what we have to look forward to. This world is not our home. And I have no idea what 2021 looks like. But I really don't care too much because this world is not my home. And I hope that you'll remind me of that because I get frustrated and I get angry 
You can just delete half of my Facebook posts. You don't even have to read them. Because I don't always maintain the kind of things that we've talked about this morning, although I certainly should. And I know I can do better. And I need to. We want to encourage you this morning to make your life right in any way. You can be baptized into Jesus Christ. Have your sins washed away. Raised to walk in newness of life. Be a brand new creature in Christ. Serve a God who loved you so much before time began. That he was willing to watch his son die for you. And for me. I don't know how to put words into that kind of sacrifice. It transcends our ability. And the only thing I've ever been able to liken it to is that I know I could die for some of you. But I really seriously doubt I could ever sacrifice one of my four children for anybody in this room. Especially if you lied about one of my boys or girls or you had hurt them, tried to harm them. It's not within me to do that. I don't have that kind of love. But we serve a God who is so rich in his love for us, so abundant in his mercy. How could you ever drift away? If you drifted away and you need your faith restored, you need to have the prayers of the brothers and sisters in Christ. I know without question these brethren want to help you in any way. Come to the front right now as we stand and sing. When the trumpet of